Well, good morning, Liberty. It's good to be here this morning. It's good to uh, get the opportunity to preach this morning. Uh, my name is Michael. If I haven't gotten to meet you yet, my family and I, and my wife, my three-year-old daughter, myself, we've been part of Liberty since probably about October, November of this past year. And I don't know. We're excited. We love it here. And I do want to mention, since we've been here, it's almost like legends have stood behind this pulpit. That if I were to list off the names of the preachers we've had, the men and women behind this pulpit, it's like the starting lineup of an all-star game of pastors. So I am, I'm humbled to be here, and I'm humbled to be able to share the Word of God with you. And, and we're so thankful for this church uh, I've, I've had the privilege of being able to be on this worship team, and, and I can tell you, uh, especially if you're new, the, the talent of the worship team is only outmatched by their attitude and their love for Jesus. Uh, they are exceptional people. Uh, so I wanted you to know that, that the people leading you in worship every single week really have the heart behind it. They have the true heart, the true passion to worship and give glory to our Father. Uh, and then I also want to give a quick shout out to, since we have a three-year-old daughter, everyone who works in the kids' ministry, uh, you are the unsung heroes of this church. <laughs> since we started coming here uh, late fall, uh, I've noticed in my conversations with my daughter, you know, we, we put her to bed at night and we pray with her and, and we talk about Jesus. And, and there was one night after we started attending that she actually initiated the conversation. She said, Dad... Do you know that Jesus lives in your heart? I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do know that. And she's like, yeah, he's with you everywhere you go. At three years old, she was getting this. And so every Sunday after church, when we pick up our daughter, she's able to share the story from the Bible that they learned that day. And so my family, my family is so thankful for those of you who serve in our kids' ministry or if you're new, just know that our kids' ministry here at Liberty is exceptional. But I've spent over 10 years as a pastor. I was a youth and executive pastor, first in Nashville and then in Kansas. And, and this month actually marks one year that my family moved up here to the area to serve at North Point Bible College as the dean of students. Now, in addition to being part of the administration, I also have the incredible privilege to teach some classes, and, and some of the classes I teach because of my history as a youth pastor, because of my passion to raise up future youth ministers, is to teach the youth ministry classes. But this past year, one of my classes is called Discipling Students. They put at 8 a.m. Now, while that's fine for most of you, and yes, that's fine for me, I was able to walk to the class and carry a coffee in with me, uh, these are college students, <laughs> And if you have a college-age student, you know 8 a.m. is not the easiest time for a young adult. But not only do they actually have to show up to class, we expect them to engage in the class. But not only that, we expect them to re retain the information that I'm teaching at 8 a.m. And because I, I try not to be a professor who tricks the students, who overwhelms the students with information, I try to make sure that, that by the time they leave the classroom that morning, they can remember the main things we talked about. Not just so that they get an A on a test or an A on a final, but we're dealing with future ministers here. And I know that if they retain the information in these youth ministry classes, especially this one, how to disciple students, that it can affect their future ministry. So it's important that they understand what's being taught. Now, maybe you've had a similar experience, either in a class or maybe at work, maybe at work where you're sitting in a long meeting and maybe the sports game from the night before or your schedule for the remainder of that day or that week or when you have to pick up the kids, that stuff starts creeping into your mind while you're in this meeting, this important meeting. But thankfully, at the end of the meeting, your boss says, okay, Here's what needs to be done, and then walks you through those action steps and reviews everything that you just talked about. Aren't you so thankful for those moments where it's just summed up and you're like, okay, good, because I was just spacing out. But the whole time you're just nodding your head. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Or maybe you've been at church, and of course, not at Liberty, but, you know, the other church, and, and where you've gotten distracted during the message and then finally, towards the end, the pastor says, now the worship team's going to come back up. And, and you know, okay, 
We're getting close to being finished, and the application is coming. Here we go. He's going to re-hit the points. He's going to give us something to take home. I'm so thankful for those moments because, yeah, my mind wanders, not at Liberty, but the other churches. I remember when I was a kid, uh, the pastor of the church I grew up with, grew up in in Missouri, uh, he had this habit, I would call it, where as he was wrapping up the sermon, he would always come down to the front steps in front of the pulpit as he was wrapping everything up. And he was so consistent with it and so reliable that people in the church actually started taking it as a sign that he was closing. I mean, it was amazing. He would come down to the steps, and the worship team would just walk right up. They knew it was coming to a close. He would come down to the steps, and the ushers and the greeters slowly made their way to their positions at the door. He would go down to the steps, and somebody would notify the kids' ministry, hey, pastor's wrapping up. Let's go. And my favorite was that he would come down to the steps, and you can just look around the room, and mothers started gathering their children, <laughs> gathering all the toys and the coloring books that had been spread out, because they knew it was just a matter of minutes until they'd be dismissed. And this moment on the steps, it, it was amazing, though. It was when the pastor would just bring the message home. He was gathering everything from the past 30, 40 minutes from his sermon and making sure that we understood what God was speaking to us that day. Well, over the past few months, we've been going through the book of Romans as a church. And our passage today really is the moment where Paul in his letter is coming down to the steps in front of the pulpit. This is the moment where Paul is saying that everything that's been in the message so far has led up to this point. This is the moment where Paul's putting down the landing gear, you could say, and is ready to bring it home. And this passage we find in Romans 12. Now, I do have to say, Pastor Bill last week had the whole of Romans 11, and I get two verses, which I'm totally fine with. He actually had the harder job because these two verses are so powerful, and, and you can read them on the screen with me as well. But it's Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, and it says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this morning, we're going to go through these two verses, this passage, and, and try to understand what Paul is writing to the church of Rome in this powerful, powerful statement. I mean, he starts out the message saying, therefore, therefore. I mean, one of the things I learned in Bible college when I was young is when you see the word therefore, you need to ask, what is it there for? And so it's, it's a good way to remember when you see therefore, look backwards. Look to see where the writer is coming from. Where did they just hit? What did they just talk about? So, so far in Romans, because like I said, this is Paul landing the plane. So when he says, therefore, he's not just talking about Romans 11. He's talking about the past 11 chapters. And we've seen that the church in Rome was horribly divided between the Gentiles and the Jewish people. And so in an effort to unify the church, Paul spends chapters 1 through 4 revealing God's righteousness. He essentially starts from the beginning and presents the gospel so that everyone's on the same page. Chapters 5 through 8, Paul declares that God created a new humanity that is no longer divided between Jew or Gentile. That all are one under Jesus. And then in chapters 9 through 11, God fulfills his promise to Israel. So now... After 11 chapters of some of the most profound and stirring teaching in all of Scripture, Paul says this, therefore. He says, therefore, remember everything I've talked about? This is the moment where it all makes sense. But not only does Paul invoke the last 11 chapters, but he really lays it on. Because he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Paul is saying, have you been saved? Listen up. Have you been freed from the bondage of sin? This is for you. 
Have you deserved eternity in, in hell, and yet God in his amazing mercy delivered you? Then listen to what I'm about to say. So after 11 chapters of powerful teaching about what God has given to those of us who call ourselves followers of Christ, Paul now turns around and challenges us in these two verses with three parts of our life that God is asking us to give back. Because let me say, it's so easy for us as Christians to focus on what we get as if eternity in heaven isn't enough. But here Paul is saying, Give back. Here's what God is asking for those of us who are followers of Christ. So the first one is this. God is asking us to give our bodies, right? He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Give your bodies Now, one thing I want us to remember from the book of Romans is that Paul is addressing the church of Rome. He even begins this passage with saying, I urge you, brothers and sisters, reiterating the fact that he's talking to fellow believers. And if he's talking to Christians, then that means he's addressing an audience that has already given their hearts and their souls to Christ. So why is Paul saying to give your bodies as well? I mean, didn't he write in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved? Yes, Paul did indeed write that. Isn't that enough? And yes, Jesus wants you to make that decision and wants you to be saved, but Jesus is asking for more. He's asking you to follow him. He's asking you to be his disciple, and that requires more than just a decision. That requires everything. When Paul urges us to give our bodies, he's meaning every part of us, every desire to please our flesh and please our wants and desires that we have ourselves. Everything we do, everything we say, Paul is asking us, that's what you need to give. You see, Jesus doesn't just want your heart. He wants your whole self. He wants your whole life. You see, we've gotten good at segmenting our life and keeping things separate. We've gotten good at like those picnic dinners where you have one of those styrofoam plates that have the dividers in them. We've gotten good at separating our life from each other. You know, those plates where you put your green beans in one slot and your mashed potatoes in another and there's a divider so that the green bean juice doesn't slide into the mashed potatoes. That's what we're doing with our life. We've gotten so good at putting up the barriers so our church life doesn't bleed into our work life and our friend life and our school life and our social life and even our love life. Now, now maybe you let your church life bleed into your family life just a little bit. You'll, You'll occasionally have those conversations about Jesus at home, only when it's convenient and you don't have baseball or football practice, right? But as a follower of Jesus... There can't be a different you. There can't be a segmented life. Jesus wants it all. There can't be a church life and a work life and a friend life and a school life. There can only be one life, and that should be your disciple life. And your disciple life is what goes with you to work and school and when you're with your friends. You see, when you gave your life to Jesus, if you only gave him your Sunday mornings, you didn't really give your life to Jesus. You just gave him part of it. You see, Jesus wants to be the Lord of your whole life, of your whole self. Paul says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he says, this is true and proper worship. Now, to be honest, some of you may have thought, and and I understand if you think this, some of you may have thought that singing songs on a Sunday morning was enough. Isn't that worship? Well, yes, it is, but that doesn't cost you anything. It's easy to worship when Pastor Mary's up here singing those old songs and encouraging you and inviting you in. Oh, it is so easy to worship Jesus when you're in this place. There's no sacrifice required, though. A sacrifice has to cost something. There's no sacrifice required to join in with a room of believers. Does God love it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should we keep worshiping together on Sundays? Of course we should. 
Worshiping together on Sundays, though, should be a reflection of our daily lives of worship, not our only worship. You see, Paul says that if you want to give some true and proper worship to an almighty God who bought you with a price, give God your whole self. We must realize that true godly worship is not simply an activity in a church service, but it's a lifestyle that brings honor to Christ in our words and in our actions. So how about this? Let's make a deal. I'm going to worship God with my whole self as a living sacrifice each day. And when we come together on a Sunday morning, we're going to party and we're going to celebrate God together and his goodness. And that's going to be our worship on Sunday mornings. You know, if you didn't know, today is actually Pentecost Sunday, uh, which I, I love this day. I mean, it causes us to think back to the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts where the, it's the first instance of spirit baptism that happened. And, and, and so one, once the disciples in those upper room, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, they stepped outside, if you remember. And Peter, now empowered by the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel message, and 3,000 people get saved in one moment. Man, that's Pentecost. That's exciting. And this incredible gift from God of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not reserved only for a Sunday morning church service. God didn't give the disciples and the followers of Jesus the baptism of the Holy Spirit for them to only have in the upper room. The first thing they did was go outside and share the gospel. It was an empowerment for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in the next chapter, Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were just walking to the temple one day in the afternoon to pray, and they came across a beggar who was crippled. The beggar asked for money, and Peter replied, we don't have any money, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ and Nazareth. Get up and walk, and the crippled beggar jumped up and walked, and then they were arrested, and then they used that opportunity to share the gospel with so many people. These men were true disciples of Jesus Christ. They had given their bodies. They would given their whole lives to following Jesus. And so, when they had a powerful move of God in a prayer time, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, they didn't compartmentalize their life. They didn't reserve that powerful encounter for Sunday mornings around other believers. No, they let what God was doing affect their entire life. So that when they were going outside, or when they were walking through town, they were the same disciples of Jesus as they were around other believers. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, we have to give him every part of our lives. We have to be his disciples everywhere we go. And yes, that does include when you're around those friends who may look at you a little different when you start being a disciple. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable. Absolutely it is. But a sacrifice Paul calls it a living sacrifice. A sacrifice has to cost something. Giving God just a portion of your life or giving God your leftovers, giving God your second best isn't a sacrifice. God is asking us to give our whole self. He's asking us to give our bodies. Second one is this, that God is asking us to give our minds. Give our minds. He writes this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, you can make a whole sermon out of just these few words, just this passage alone. Because in Paul's day 2,000 years ago, there was very real pressure to conform to the pattern of the world and to fit its mold. The church he was writing to, the church of Rome, had gone incredibly worldly. I mean, they were just surrounded by so many pressures. And today is no different. You know, today, there's pressure to do this or that or respond this way or that way. There's pressure that if you don't accept someone's lifestyle, then apparently that means you don't love them or care about them. There's pressure in so many areas. In fact, it seems like even in the last couple of years, the pressure has got even tighter. But Paul says, don't conform. Instead, transform. Don't be like everyone else. Don't be like the world. The world is constantly changing. But instead, be like Christ, who is constant, who is perfect. Be like Jesus. And Paul says this way of transformation comes through the renewing of your mind. 
So what does it mean to renew your mind? That's kind of an odd statement. You know, transformation, that's a powerful term. But what does it mean to renew your mind? How do you renew your mind to be more like Jesus? And the answer is actually surprisingly simple. The word of God, the Bible. See, when you become a Christian, there should be a transformation that takes place where your behaviors and your attitudes start emulating the ways and the life of Jesus. When you give them your whole self, your bodies, your attitudes, your actions, your words, everything should start being like Jesus. And part of that transformation involves taking this book called the Bible and not just reading it, but actually doing what it says. You see, this book is alive. This book is actually the only book where the author is right there with you every time you read it. And it's not just a collection of old stories that, and accounts that are randomly put together. The Bible is called the Word of God because God speaks through it. He inspired each and every writer to write down each and every word. And in fact, Paul later tells Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed, meaning that it comes from God, that it's incapable of error. You can trust the Bible. So if you want to know the mind of God, and if you want to be transformed like the Son of God, then you have to read the Word of God. And the Word of God literally has the power to transform your life. And I don't say that lightly. I really do mean that the word of God has the power to transform your life. In fact, there was a study that was done recently by the Center of Bible Engagement on what happens when you engage with God's word. They surveyed about 40,000 people ages 8 to 80. And the study indicated that when people engaged in scripture one time a week, And yes, that even includes when the pastor says, open your Bible, read the scripture. That's engaging with the word one time a week. So when you engage the word with one time a week, one moment of engagement with the Bible, the study noticed that there was just a negligible effect on some key areas of their life, that it was almost like nothing really happened, nothing changed. The same result was actually true if people engaged with scripture two times a week. Now, you're probably wondering, you know, Michael, where are you going? I thought you said the Bible has the power to transform your life. Well, hang on. Three times a week saw a small change. There was a slight pulse on the chart. There was a slight blip on the radar. Something moved in the behavior of the person that engaged with Scripture. But the eye-opener happened when Bible engagement reached at least four times a week. And the effects dramatically spiked across the charts. In fact, I have some statistics that you can see up on the screen of just what happened when somebody engaged with Scripture four times a week. And we see this. Feeling lonely dropped 30% when you engage four times a week with Scripture. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationship drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. And get these last two. Sharing faith jumps 200%. Discipling others jumps 230%. The word of God has power to transform our lives. When you commit to engaging with God's word, when you renew your mind with the power of scripture, God's word literally transforms your life. You know, I'm the first pastor in my family. I grew up in a Christian home, but first pastor in my family. In fact, uh, probably the first person in my family who would actually get up in front of people on a stage and, and preach Um, But despite being the first pastor in my family, despite having advanced degrees and, and despite teaching at a Bible college, I could almost guarantee that there's someone else in my family who knows the Bible better than I do. And that's my 91 year old grandfather. Uh, He, he's a lifelong welder. He served in the air force for many years But what amazes me is that when he was 17 years old, could have been a student in the youth group here, 17 years old, he made a commitment to God saying, God, I want to live my life fully for you. 
I mean, he had, he had made the decision to be a Christian long before that, but at 17 years old, he said, okay, if I'm gonna be a follower of Jesus, I'm gonna commit to reading the word of God. And at 17 years old, he committed to reading the Bible every single day for the rest of his life. Now, maybe you've made that commitment before. I've made that commitment before. But he's 91 now, so the past 74 years, he can count on one hand, there were three days in 74 years where he did not read his Bible. Three days. For many of us in this room, we could count three days in the last month or even in the last week where we didn't engage with Scripture. But from the age of 17 to 91, and he's still alive and doing it today, he's read his Bible every single day but three days, and he could tell you exactly what he was doing those three days. Two of them weren't even his fault. One day he was in the Air Force, and, and he always had a routine of waking up, reading his Bible before the day starts, and his commanding officer that day woke them up super early and went out for a training run or whatever, and they didn't get back till after midnight, so he didn't get a chance to read his Bible. Not his fault. <laughs> Another time, he was out hunting with some friends, and they were supposed to come back in the evening. And so he thought, okay, I'll, I'll be able to read my Bible when we get back to the cabin in the evening. It'll be great because they left early in the morning. But as they were out, some of the other guys said, hey, let's actually stay out here. And they went and found a different cabin, blah, 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 all that. And they ended up staying overnight. So he was unable to read his Bible that day. Again, not his fault. The one day that actually was his fault was when he had an RV later in life with my grandmother and they were driving across the country and they decided to leave really, really early in the morning. And then by the time they got there late at night, they, uh, they were so tired and he honestly just forgot. And as he's telling me the story, you could see the pain and regret in his face that he missed reading the Bible that day, that it was his fault. 74 years in fact, now at 91 years old, he actually has two Bible reading plans going on at the same time, one in the morning, one in the evening. So he's doubling up now. And while that's impressive, there's a difference between just reading the Bible to check it off and actually engaging with the Bible. And I had always known that Grandpa reads his Bible. He, he always had it setting on the table on the end table next to his lazy boy recliner and you don't sit in grandpa's lazy boy recliner but he always had the bible there so I knew that it was part of his life and I had seen the fruit in his life through his generosity through his kindness all that I'd seen that but this past fall there was a powerful moment that I will remember for the rest of my life because you see, after we moved up here to Massachusetts, a few months later, my grandmother got diagnosed with stage four cancer. And, and they had said, hey, she just has a matter of maybe six months to live. But within weeks, her health started declining rapidly. And through, through an outstanding blessing and providence and miracle of God, I was actually able, I had a scheduled uh, work trip to go back to uh, Missouri and Kansas, and they live in northern Missouri, so I was able that day to drive up to northern Missouri, and, and I got to see her the morning before she passed that night. It was an incredible miracle and blessing of God. So when I went up to the house and, and I walked in, my dad had warned me. He said, you know, grandma's not responsive. She's alive, but she's laying on a hospital bed in, our living, in the living room. And, and so just know she may not be able to talk to you, but she's still alive. You know, you could go in and see her. So I went into the living room and, and I saw her and my grandpa was sitting right there next to her. And after the initial moment of shock, you could say, of, of seeing my grandmother, who had been this incredible, loving woman and example of Jesus to me my whole life, after the shock of seeing her in the state about to pass away, my grandfather and I just started talking, and he started sharing more stories about his life that I had never heard about. He, he talked about the three days where he didn't read his Bible because I had asked him about it. And as we were about to leave, we spent a few hours but as we were about to leave, I remember I had my, at the time, two-year-old daughter in my arms, and I told her, all right, say, say goodbye to great-grandma, and, you know, tell her I love you all. It was so sweet. And we're about to walk out, and, and the last image I see of my grandmother alive is when she's lying on the bed, again, unresponsive, but my grandfather, her husband of 70 years, sitting next to her, holding her hand with one hand, and his other hand is outstretched in worship. That is a life of someone who's engaged with Scripture daily for 74 years. 
Scripture has the power to transform your life. You see, when you allow Scripture to renew your mind, your whole world becomes transformed. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? So they might not sin against you. When you not only start reading scripture, but renewing your mind with scripture, as Paul tells us, replacing the junk of the world with the word of God, then it radically changes your behavior. It will change how you treat people. It will change what you say. It will change what you do. And there should be such a transformation that you could declare through the renewal of your mind, as the psalmist writes, that because you've hidden the word of God in your heart, that you might not sin against God. God is asking us to give our minds. And third is this, that God is asking us to give our wills. He finishes up these two verses saying, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. As the worship team makes their way back up, uh, there's a Christian author that I love reading. His name's Bob Goff. And maybe you've heard his name. Maybe you've read a book. One of his books I've read that I love is called Love Does. And, and in this book, he tells a story about how when his kids were growing up, they had seen and heard about the tension across the globe. He talks about the morning of September 11th and, and making sure that he was the first one to tell them what had happened. Um, whenever it did happen. And so it was after that uh, atrocity that they began having these conversations and, and about the tension across the globe. And so he said, okay, kids, what would you want to do? And they had the idea to write to each world leader across the whole world, every president, every prime minister, every dictator, every king, queen, prince, princess, every single one of them, and ask if they could come and do a video interview with them, asking what their hopes and dreams were, and interview them on a personal level. Because if they, they thought if they could record this and share the videos of world leaders with other world leaders, then maybe, just maybe, they would realize that a lot of them were actually hoping for the same thing. And they would be friendlier with each other. How beautiful the naivety of kids, right? Now, while it's a cute and sweet idea, the kids didn't realize how naive it actually was to write to each leader, to, have, to invite the kids over, to do an interview about hopes and dreams. So Bob still encouraged them, and, and he and his wife made a deal with the kids. He said, hey, as you write these letters... If they ever invite you to come by and, and do this interview, if they ever invite you to their palace or to the equivalent of a White House, if they invite you to their country, the answer's yes. He said the answer's yes, and not thinking much of what would happen. So they mailed off their letters, and, and they started to check their mailbox every day after a couple weeks and to see if they got any replies. Soon they started getting letters come in, dozens and dozens of responses. Most of them pretty much said thanks but no thanks in a very kind way. Maybe they give them, gave them a little memento from their country. But then after a few weeks, they looked through the letters, opening them up, and they opened a letter from the state house in Bulgaria that invited them to the palace to meet. Well, Bob said the answer is yes, right? Then a day or two later, a letter came in from the minister of Switzerland, inviting them to visit. And then the president of Israel invited them to come to Jerusalem. Over the following weeks, they received 29 invitations to come and video interview presidents, kings, queens, and dictators. And remember, Bob and his wife said, if any of, you invite, if, if any of them invites you, the answer is yes. So they planned out a massive family trip that took the family to palaces and state houses of 29 different countries and heard the stories from dictators and kings and queens about their grandkids or even what they did when they were young. And those leaders shared their hopes and dreams for their countries and their dreams of peace and friendship between nations. And while that's a beautiful story, what sticks out to me is that before all this happened, 
before knowing what would be asked of him, Bob's answer to his kids was yes. Church, we're really good at saying yes to God's will for our lives as long as it lines up with our will for our lives. You see, we love trusting God. We love following his way when his way is the same as our way. We're totally fine with being obedient whenever we're okay with the plan. But after giving God our bodies and our whole lives, after giving him our minds to be renewed by the power of his word, God is asking us to give him our wills. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. When I was 14 years old, I was at a youth camp one summer in northern Missouri. And I highly encourage, if you have a teenager, send your kid to camp, please. But I remember being at an altar and, and making the decision at 14 years old that whatever God would ask for me, ask of me, the answer is yes. God, I don't know what you're gonna do with my life. God, I have it all planned out. And I really did. At 14 years old, I was a very motivated kid. I had my hopes and dreams and my plans and my goals. I had it all laid out. But I was willing to set that on the altar and say, God, I don't know what you wanna do. But the answer is yes. And can I tell you this? His way is far better than what I had planned. His plan really has been better than what I had laid out for myself. And to be honest, being dean of students at a Bible college was not in my plans in high school. Honestly, it wasn't even in my plans as a pastor just a few years ago. But even then, just over a year ago, my wife and I said that God's will is better than our comfort zone. And after prayer, we made the decision to take a step of faith to follow his will for our lives. God is asking us for our wills. And can I tell you, making the decision to set aside your will, to follow God's will, doesn't mean that everything is going to be happy and without pain all the time doesn't mean that everything's going to be sunshines and roses and daisies 100%. If I could be totally transparent and honest, within two months of moving here, halfway across the country, we suffered a miscarriage. A couple months after that, my grandmother passed away. A few weeks ago, as some of you may rem remember me sharing, I was in the worst car wreck of my life. But I can stand before you today and say with full confidence that we know, that we know, that we know that we are in the center of God's will for our lives. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And most of the time, really, things have been great. We really love it here. We do. But even in the hardest of moments, just like with my grandfather, we have a peace that surpasses all understanding and a joy that is truly unspeakable and full of glory. So as we wrap up today, got to go down to the stairs. First, if you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, if you've never made that decision to live for him, to give him your heart, to trust him with your life, to accept the incredible gift of salvation that God has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross. I wanna invite you to do that this morning. At the end of our service, or here in a minute during worship, we're gonna have people that can pray with you. They would love to introduce you to Jesus and kind of walk you through what this looks like. But I wanna make sure you understand this life, giving him your life, living for Jesus, becoming a follower of Christ, really is the best decision you'll ever make. And for the rest of us that call ourselves followers of Christ, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true 
proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and his perfect will. As we worship here in a moment, I would invite you to respond. There's something powerful about coming to the front, about coming to an altar to spend time with Jesus. And this morning, the Lord is asking you, have you given me your whole life? Have you given me your body? Everything about you, not just your heart, but your whole life, every part of your life, or are you segmenting it like that plate? Give me your whole life. Jesus is asking you in this moment, give me your mind. Get the junk out of your mind and be transformed by the power of the word of God. You can make a decision even this morning, like my grandfather did at 17 years old, that, that will affect you even when you're 91 years old and your grandson could be talking on a stage about the decision you made on this Sunday morning. God is asking you to give your mind. And God is asking you to give your will today. Do you have plans? Great, that's awesome. Set them down. You have goals and hopes and dreams? Great. It's good to be ambitious that way. Can I tell you God's plan is far better? He knows the true desires of your heart. And God is asking you to give that over to him and trust him with it and see what he will do with it. So I'm gonna pray for you. And we're gonna have a time of worship. And while we're worshiping, feel free to come down. This altar is yours. Either to give your life to Jesus Christ and if you want to do that, somebody will be down here. Come find one of us in the front. We would love to talk to you. But if you just need to come here and, and give God your life, your whole life, your bodies, give God your mind, give God your will, spend time at this altar and give it all up to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, you are so good and so faithful. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, so much so that as Paul wrote, in view of God's mercy, that we know that we have the incredible mercy of God that has saved us and transformed us. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in this place, speak to the hearts, convict those that need convicting, bring to mind the things that need to be brought to mind. God, for those that need to give their life over to you, to make the decision to be a follower of Christ. Father, I pray that you would speak to them in this moment. And God, for all of us, as you are asking us to give our bodies, to give our minds, to give our wills, Father, I pray that we would lay those down at the feet of Jesus, trusting you with all those things. So Father, thank you for what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name, let's worship together. Let's stand.